Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Very excited to have you join us today. Welcome to the Pierce Atwood Energy Group uh, webinar on energy supply chain constraints and the federal response. Very excited to have you here. Um, this is a one of a series of Pierce Atwood uh, Energy Group webinars discussing various topics. You should have more information in the invitation you received here on some upcoming seminars dealing with hydrogen and some other, other sectors. Um, Today, we're going to be discussing the, the supply chain constraint issues that have been impacting the energy sector in recent years and some of the federal responses that are associated with that. Um, we'll get into a, a, a great bit of detail on a number of, of the energy sectors. I think we're going to be using transformers as kind of the guinea pig uh, uh, to give some, some uh, context around it, but uh, certainly it's not the only uh, sector that's been dealing with, with some uh, supply chain issues. So. I uh, encourage you to please uh, put any questions you may have in the bottom screen. Uh, you'll see a Q&A or a chat tab. If you put the put your questions in there, we'll do our best to bring them to the panel. Uh, we'll be here for an hour today. Um, and uh, when, when we're done today, we'll have uh, the, a recording and the, and the materials put posted to uh, the Pierce Atwood website. And you'll be receiving an email from our team uh, with a link to, to that site after we're done with the presentation today. So with all that administrative stuff uh, taken care of, I'm going to introduce our panel today. I'm very excited to have uh, Assistant Secretary of the Office of Electricity join us today, Gene Rodriguez. Um, Gene is uh, one of the newer folks over at, over at DOE and has been actively involved in, in uh, dealing with uh, not only DOE, but a, a coalition of federal agencies dealing with supply chain issues, and he'll get into more detail on that in just one moment. Also pleased to have Adrian Lotto join us with APPA. Adrian's a senior vice president, and amongst a myriad of other things, she deals with federal agencies and uh, has been intimately involved in supply chain issues for her members, uh, and she'll go, go into greater detail about the APPA and, and her efforts there. And then finally, and uh, certainly not the least, Merrill Kramer, my partner and colleague at Pierce Atwood. Uh, Merrill has been doing energy finance and transactional work for, uh, for a long time, and we'll be presenting today on some of the federal programs uh, that we've identified to help address the, uh, the manufacturing uh, uh, constraints. So with that, Gene, I'm going to ask you to uh, unmute and, and introduce yourself and take the conversation where you want it to go. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. And it's a, a real pleasure to be here with you and, and our co-panelists and, of course, all the folks who are, are listening in. Uh, look, I'm going to uh, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and hop right in. So uh, Gene Rodriguez, I'm the assistant secretary for the Office of Electricity. And, and in my uh, capacity in that role, uh, what we focus on in my office is uh, four things reliability, resilience, security, and affordability of America's grid. It's the, it's the foundation for everything from our economic well-being to our national security. So that's why I, uh, even early in our process here, have jumped in feet first to help address some of the issues that we're seeing in the industry around supply chain issues. And Joe, I think you, you do us a, all a good favor by saying, Let's focus first on distribution transformers, but, but I want everyone to understand out here, uh, supply chain issues aren't just about one component on the system. What we really need to do is be looking at things holistically. And, and I guess by way of my little five minute introduction before we have conversation, I'll, let me tell you how we're trying to address things holistically from the, the US government side. So, so Joe, you, you, you first pointed out that the, the first things first, we needed to make sure that we have for this type of issue, which is a complex issue. Now, all market issues are complex, and this one is especially complex, uh, uh, coordination within U.S. government. So uh, on our side of the table, what we're working on together inside the Department of Energy, inside the whole U.S. government, is how to coordinate and collaborate all the resources and abilities we have to to focus on this issue to make a difference both in the near term and the longer term. So I have the privilege of leading around distribution transformers, uh, uh, an effort that includes within the Department of Energy, my own department, the Office of Electricity, but also the Office of Policy, uh, the Cybersecurity, Energy Security uh, and Emergency Response Division or CSER, 
uh, the Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains, who bring a, a, a lot of resources to the table. Uh, the Grid Deployment Office, who's spending a, an awful lot of money that Merrill will be talking about uh, in more detail later uh, to help modernize grid. The Loan Programs Office, uh, another area that helps out with investment in manufacturing, I'll be talking about. The Office of the Secretary, and of course, consultation with EERE. But, but because this issue has... Uh, uh, a, a host of attributes to it, including labor component, materials component, the uh, uh, systems uh, component to it as well for the devices. We've also brought in folks from the National Economic Council, uh, the Department of Labor, Department of Commerce, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, FEMA, National Security Council. I'm, I'm sure I'm leaving somebody out, but uh, but but. Uh, long story short, we, we, we've got a pretty full table there. And, and that's about the collaboration within U.S. government, Bart Joe. But I think what's most important is, is not just that we brought the right players from government to this, but it's who we work with, how we collaborate. And I'm very proud to say uh, that uh, as we address this issue, we're working with industry side by side at the table, everyone rolling up in the sleeves. So we're very proud of the partnership we have uh, with uh, Adrienne's on this uh, from American Public Power Association, but also EEI with the, the investor owned utilities and NRECA with the, the co-ops. And so that, that gets the power sector and government together. And then obviously we need our partners, the trade partners. So we've got the manufacturers at the table. Joe, that's how you and I met. Uh, around uh, Transformer Manufacturing Association of America, uh, uh, standing up and willing to roll up the sleeves to help work on this issue, but also with the individual manufacturers who've done a wonderful job, Central Maloney, Howard Industries, GE, Eaton Cooper, Ermco Spire, Hitachi, uh, Delta Star. Uh, uh, um, again, if I've left somebody out, my apologies, uh, just trying to go through my heads uh, uh, of everyone but also the, the suppliers of uh, 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 American grain-oriented electric steel, which is a big part of the supply chain issue. So uh, long story short, that's all the right people at the table. So what do we do about it? And, and uh, the way we're addressing this, trying to figure out how can we be, uh, get uh, this group, this consolidation, this collaboration of private sector, uh, public sector, power industry, uh, manufacturers, distributors, et cetera, all together to, to make an impact. And the first thing we're doing is trying to look at it. What near-term things can we do to help alleviate some of the pressure? And that has also has longer term uh, uh, impacts that address the core of the issues so that we insulate ourselves some, some of the impact. So first things first is uh, anyone in business knows what do you need before you can make investment? You need some sort, some level of certainty. So one of the things we're very proud of uh, having done is put the national labs together uh, in this country and put them on the specific issue of taking a hard look at, on a national level, what is the demand signal going to be for uh, all the components, systems, cubs, uh, subsystems, materials that go into distribution transformers and the rest of grid modernization. Our initial work is, is coming up with the results. And, and long story short, it, there are two uh, important things that come out of that. Number one, this demand signal is going to uh, last out through 2035, 2045 into 2050. Why is that important? It's because in, in this sector, in the power sector, we've seen ups and downs, valleys and, 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 and uh, peaks for demand for product, including distribution transformers. Uh, and so that sent an, uh, an uncertainty signal into the investment community. I know we have financial people on the table, uh, at the table for this uh, discussion. We want to provide the manufacturers, the uh, suppliers of material and investment community with certainty that this signal will be here so you can make long-term investments in American manufacturing, in American labor, to, to help address these issues. I think we've done that. Uh, all of that information is not fully public yet, but uh, all of the power associations uh, have that information at their hand, as do the, the manufacturer sector as well. 
then beyond that, I know we've got Merrill on. He's going to go into some of the details uh, around how uh, federal government is helping to address some of the capital uh, investment requirements. But uh, I'll just say uh, uh, kind of broadly before we start our discussion, Joe, uh, what we're doing is trying to look at it in uh, multiple approaches. So from my own office, the Office of Electricity, uh, we're looking uh, not just at how much money we can add to the marketplace, but where we can have it spent. So we're doing research and development on transformer design, looking at more flexible designs, looking at more interoperability to try to uh, bring a little more rational basis to the distribution transformer market so that we have uh, more standardization, more interoperability, less one-off design out there, which will help to, to meet the needs of the market. Uh, but also materials research so that we can use more, not just earth abundant materials, but America abundant materials and labor, and then try to find ways to get capital into American manufacturing, American labor. So uh, Merrill will go into some of this, but, but uh, I will just highlight a, a few things. Uh, we've got the Advanced Energy Manufacturing Recycling Grant Program that has 750 million for small and medium manufacturers to uh, accept, uh, what, re-equip, uh, uh, refurbish, expand facilities to produce advanced energy components. The 48C tax credits, I, I'll let Merrill uh, spend some time talking about that. Please, those of you who are on this uh, call who, who do not have a fulsome understanding of it, it, it it's a tremendous opportunity up to a 30% tax credit to equip, expand, and uh, uh, and establish reindustrial uh, manufacturing facilities. Uh, it's a great opportunity, money on table, but we also have uh, financial assistance in the form of uh, our loan program office, uh, loans and guarantees that support not just manufacturers, but also utilities uh, looking to, to put uh, 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 more distribution transformers into the market quicker. Uh, uh, and we also have uh, within all of those things under the bipartisan infrastructure law component, uh, over $10 billion for grid resilience. Uh, that includes manufacturing of, of transformers, uh, but 10, I said 10 billion for that, 10 million for an energy efficient transformer rebate program that's on the street right now as we speak, that provides uh, at least at the start up to 25K per entity for putting uh, uh, efficient transformers into the fleet. So long story short, let me tie a quick ribbon around it because I know we want to have lots of fulsome discussion. But, but the idea here is, this is, uh, Joe, this is a hammer and tongs issue. It's not something you deal with onesie, twosie, piecemeal. We're bringing all the resources of government. We're working with all the components of the private sector working together, not just in coordination, but in collaboration to attack the issue uh, from a policy basis, from a materials basis, from a systems basis and subsystems basis, components, devices, the whole nine yards. And uh, quite frankly, I'm, I'm very, very proud of uh, the way this is working. It's, it's the effort that allowed me to meet you, Joe, and, and uh, uh, it's uh, also the effort that allowed me to roll up my sleeves and work side by side with someone uh, as expert and committed as Adrian Lotto from American Public Power. So uh, I, I'm really looking forward to the, the conversation, the discussion. Uh, I, I hope that this kind of rapid fire introduction doesn't scare off any of our audience. This is a complex issue, but we're dealing with it with a, a, a lot of nuance and, and a lot of components. And I think it's uh, going to be a, a fascinating success story uh, for the American grid and for the American people. So, Joe, let me let me send it back to you and let, let's hear from Adrian and Merrill, too. Awesome. Gene, thank you so much. That's a great, great uh, way to tee up the conversation and uh, definitely want to dig into a few of those points as we do our Q&A. And just to remind the folks that are attending, if you have questions for Gene or for any of us, feel free to drop them into the chat box and we'll do our best uh, to address them. Um, so I'm, I'm going to introduce myself, I guess, next to, um, for, for purposes of this discussion. Um, one of the hats that I wear as a, an attorney at, at Pierce Atwood is to be the executive director of the Transformer Manufacturing Association of America. This is a, a trade group. Uh, Abigail, you can go on to the next slide. 
this is a trade group that uh, represents the domestic transformer manufacturing sector, both the manufacturers themselves as well as their supply chain vendors. Um, we, uh, we, we employ about 5,000 engineers and production line operators and, and other folks, and we have indirect uh, uh, impact to about 20,000 employees here in the U.S. A lot of our members also have international operations, so this is just the domestic U.S. Uh, numbers. Um, so the team has been actively involved, as you can imagine, in a myriad of supply chain issues over the last couple of years, dealing with uh, all sectors. Uh, the the uh, distribution transformers are getting the most headlines, but we also have members that, that build medium and large power transformers, and there's certainly issues uh, associated with, with their supply chains as well. Uh, Abigail, you can go to the next slide. Um, so we, we've talked about a, a demand constraint within the distribution uh, transformer sector. We'll talk about demand constraints within other sectors as well as, as the conversation continues. But why is it there? Um, you know, it, it's easy to say it's because of COVID. Well, partially it is because of COVID. There's really not one particular cause for for the constraint. Um, the the hangover from COVID. There, you know, there was a decrease in demand until there wasn't, and then there really wasn't a decrease in demand. So there there, there was a bit of a, a of a suppression and expansion issue um, impacting the transformer sector, uh, also impacting our, our components and our, and our raw materials. Um, so there, it was more difficult for us to find the grain oriented electric steel and the structural steel and the bushings and windings and so forth that go into a component. So the delays in, in being able to locate and, and uh, import or, or, or uh, transport those materials to our facilities causes a delay in getting the ultimate product put together. Um, like many other sectors, we're dealing with labor issues. Um, that's that's uh, uh, ubiquitous uh, amongst all, all sectors, I think. Um, and, and two other interesting components that we're dealing with in the transformer sector and in the renewable energy and the clean tech sector, we've got an aging infrastructure that's causing an increased demand for replacement transformers. And at the same time, we're in the midst of this energy transition which is putting an additional pressure uh, on demand um, that will further constrain our current supply methods. And then there's other policy initiatives taking place that will, will definitely have an impact on, on the, the, uh, the ability to meet current demand, much less projected demand over the next, uh, next decades. So, um, you know, that's kind of a, a thousand foot view. There's myriad, there's a lot of details that go into that, but that's a thousand foot view of some of the pressures that the TMA members and the transformer manufacturers have been facing. So what do we expect going forward on the next slide? Uh, well, there's absolutely nothing to indicate that that demand is going to go down. Um, just to give you some examples, the 1300 power transformers were sold in 2020. Uh, that's expected to double by 2027. Um, large power transformers are looking at an increase of at least 25% by 2027. Uh, and this, this market reality, DOE to its credit, has, has identified it and, and noted that in order to meet that demand, we're, the ability to supply new transformers is going to have to multiply dramatically. Um, and that's really the intersection where Gene and I, I met, is how do we smoothly and, and, and from a market derivative basis address that that need for dramatic increase in the ability to um, to meet uh, transformer demand. So our, our suggestion and our policy positions at TMAA on the next slide, Abigail, uh, we're, we're calling for what I refer to as a Marshall Plan for domestic transformer. It's, it's, it's not just a single front, but there are multiple fronts that we're going to have to deal with. The only long-term answer to address domestic production capacity deficiencies is to increase domestic production capacity, um, not just for the transformers, but each of the, the components that we're having issues with goes, copper, insulation, bushings, all these other, other uh, transformer components that we are having uh, issues uh, satisfying our current demand are only going to get more constrained. Um, so that's not a real easy answer on the Hill, for instance. They're looking for what can you do for me next election cycle, not what can you do for me four years from now. But that is really the only long-term answer. In order to get there, what's, what are some, some tools that we can use? Well, uh, address friendshoring uh, is what I refer to it as. Are there countries where some of these components are available that we can import? 
um, that are friendly to our administration? Are we like Canada, Mexico, and UK? Um, do we have the right trade processes in place for those for those countries to um, to allow for and to incentivize uh, exchange of, of goods uh, between them? Um, are we doing all we can to encourage new goes uh, producers to come into the U.S.? That's that's a, a tricky one uh, because it costs a lot of money to put together a steel forge uh, to the volume of goes that that is required. Are there alternatives? Can you look at amorphous steel or, or other, other other producers uh, to help address some of that need? Uh, and if so, what does it take to get them to the point where they're actually producing product for, for the transformer manufacturers? Um, the Buy American Act has always always been out there, and the, the issue has always been, you know, what is the what is the domestic content percentage? What's the appropriate one? Is it an aspirational? You need to have 100% in order to qualify. Or is it more uh, reality based, based upon the current market constraints as to what what the the appropriate percentage would be? And then there's all sorts of workforce development initiatives that are uh, currently underway and cur currently under consideration that would also help encourage young engineers to look into uh, in, into the electric uh, sector and, and line operators to join the transformer manufacturers. So those are some of the policy options that we, we've advocated for in both the Hill as well as agency rule uh, uh, rulemakings. On the next slide, I'll real quickly, uh, again, Merrill's gonna talk about these. But these are some of the tools the DOE has, uh, uh, has, has produced uh, the loan programs, 1703 and 1706. Um, the Defense Production Act is an interesting one. I think uh, Adrian's gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, transformers and electric grid. Um, have specifically been identified in a presidential declaration as critical to the national security, uh, subject to Defense Production Act. To present, there hasn't been any appropriations made, and maybe we can talk about uh, ways to 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 uh, appropriate to address that national security risk. And then there's ongoing anti-dumping and countervailing uh, duties, um, particularly in the large power transformer sector. But I think the issues are ubiquitous to, um, among the various uh, very sized uh, components of transformers. And then on the last slide, um, we'll talk a little bit more about some of these in detail. These are just some resources that uh, I've been using. Uh, the Blue Green Alliance is a particularly interesting one uh, because they go beyond just the surface of we need solar, we need wind, we need offshore wind, we need transformers, but they are actually looking at identifying the subcomponents and materials within each of those sectors and identifying whether there is current domestic capacity for those trend, for those materials. Uh, if not, are we relying on a particular market uh, to import those, those materials? Um, and then our suggestion is let's take that next step. Let's look 15, 20 years down the line. What is that increased demand for each of these components and how are we going to meet that increased demand? And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the Q and A section. So with that, uh, Adrian, I will uh, turn it over to you and let you uh, talk about your experience with APPA. Sure. Thanks so much, Joe. Thanks so much, Gene. Thank you both for uh, having me today. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, so as was stated, I'm Adrian Lotto. I'm the Senior Vice President um, at APPA. Uh, so like Joe, I am a lawyer, but recovering. I was a lawyer for 15 years and then transitioned uh, over to the policy technical side. So thank you again for having me. Um, next slide, please. So just a little bit, um, Jean mentioned this earlier. <clears throat> there are, I think most people know this, but just in case, the way the sector is organized, there are three different business models fundamentally to how we run the electric grid today. I represent that first blue vertical there, public power utilities. So we're community owned. Um, we answer to uh, the people, the citizens, but there are two other models there, rural cooperatives and then the IOUs. Um, the interesting part about this slide, I think, is that we stand together on, uh, in facing this issue, which uh, is a good thing when we're always able to speak with one voice, particularly here in the Beltway. But as was mentioned earlier, is somewhat uh, unfortunate because when you hear both the USG the electric sector and the manufacturing say saying the same thing, which is, hey, guys, there's an issue here. Uh, there's probably uh, a moment there where we should all pause and take notice. And so all of us are saying the same thing, that there is an issue, as Joe mentions and Jean mentions, what are we doing to solve it, right? Uh, next slide, please. 
A little bit more about EPPA, just briefly. These are our four main pillars. This one falls into both of us where we're trying to move public power forward, but we're also, this has become as again, both Jean and Joe mentioned a grid security issue in the sense that it does have the impact or may have the potential to impact reliability and resiliency of the grid. So again, it does warrant uh, some national attention, which it's obviously getting. Uh, next slide, please. So for us, we began noticing at APPA, we, as most as trade associations do, we regularly survey our members. And actually back in 2021, this is uh, some newer info, but we started noticing uh, the uptick of longer lead times, higher prices in 21 and started uh, re really raising the alarm then. <clears throat> Unfortunately, as you guys can see here, um, the data has continued to evidence that uh, things are not getting better. And Jean and Joe spoke both about some of the reasons why, right? So the demand signal is there both in terms of uh, how some of the domestic policies are creating the demand and the sustain on a long-term demand for more distribution transformers. But unfortunately, as you can see on the slide, it does and has created much longer uh, lead times that are not going away uh, anytime soon. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm speaking, uh, my role here today is to speak from the industry side and you see some of the impacts, right? So what's happening? What's happening is it's causing, unfortunately, a little bit, uh, or in some cases, a lot of bit of a delay. So uh, Joe talked about, you know, this energy transition, the goals of electrification, things of that nature. Unfortunately, um, we're seeing some of our utilities unable to bring homes up. We're seeing a delay in manufacturing of new homes. We're seeing electrification projects getting delayed. Uh, we have also, uh, knock on wood, we have... Uh, this year, hurricane season hasn't been that bad thus far. We're still in the middle of it, and I'm also responsible for that, so that's why I'm knocking. But um, if we were to see a couple of uh, bigger storms, we saw that one hit the panhandle earlier this year, but luckily the impacts were really somewhat regional and localized. If we started to see a couple of those in a row, there is an opportunity there for uh, decreases in terms of restoration time and the ability to provide mutual aid. Well, why is that? Because part of the mutual aid network for utilities is when the bell rings or an incident occurs, we bring resources to bear on that area. And oftentimes it's not just labor resources, but it's also supplies, equipment, which includes distribution transformers. If the companies are unsure about being able to restock that equipment back home, therein rises the concern, right? We may not be as inclined to offer those types of resources. Hasn't happened yet, but we have anecdotally been discussing it. Um, and then obviously, as you saw here, potential decrease in reliability. Uh, next slide, please. So Joe mentioned this earlier. Um, again, this uh, by way of a little bit of history, we've been advocating for the use of the Defense Production Act for several uh, years now, uh, 22, it was not in uh, the uh, bu the ultimate budget, the presidential budget that was allocated. As Joe likewise mentioned here, it is not currently in the FY23 appropriated budget. <clears throat> so uh, for two years in a row, it, it hasn't been there. Um, you can see what it is. I, I won't read the slide to you, but it, it allows... Uh, the expansion of uh, certain materials and supplies to be used to promote national security, national defense. Uh, next slide, please. For the viewers who are unfamiliar, I did provide a couple of uh, use cases. It got utilized um, most, it, it gets utilized, right? You see all the way from Obama to Trump to Biden um, in a number of different instances. I think the um, Probably for the viewers, the most recent one was a lot, most often during COVID, um, you saw it used to produce masks, uh, ventilators, things of that nature. So um, that kind of brings it uh, brings it home. But unfortunately, thus far, that hasn't been the case and the USG hasn't provided any appropriated dollars. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, Joe mentioned this. Uh, I just likewise am highlighting it here. So what is creating some of the challenges? Uh, there are workforce challenges. Um, there is the workforce that is utilized to create some of these component pieces um, are, uh, are oftentimes in locations where uh, they need to stay competitive. If someone's paying a couple of more dollars down the street, a manufacturer will often lose that person and they'll see them pop up down the, down the road. So ensuring that uh, we're staying competitive uh, the turnover has been quite high. Um, we've gotten in the room with the manufacturers and they are trying to hold on to people, trying to drive up capacity. Um, but certainly it has not been easy. And Joe mentioned some of those reasons. Uh, next slide, please. So from the utility perspective, what are we doing? Um, these are some, frankly, homegrown solutions, if you will, right? The utility sector is resourceful. Um, the first one is all about purchase power, right? If they can form um, consortium, particularly because as Jean mentioned, there is some uh, differences or there are many differences, I should say, in transformers. So this often works regionally. If they can form consortia regionally um, to then increase their buying power, has it helped mixed reviews? Uh -huh. Some people have said, it hasn't really uh, driven up what they thought it was going to do. They, they're still getting the same kind of responses, but it was uh, thoughtful. They've also discussed the uh, utility sector creating their own manufacturing plant. That's something that um, NRECA, my colleagues, have had did a while back. Uh, but as was just mentioned, it requires a ton of capital, and it's not something that the utility sector has in its vertical. It's not what they're uh, you know, in their in their wheelhouse and what they know how to do day in, day out. Refurbishing transformers is uh, where the name of the game is right now. <clears throat> a lot of utilities are pulling the old ones down, having to refurbish them and then bringing them back in. As Gina and others mentioned, it does not create the uh, energy efficiency goals, but it keeps the lights on. And so what you're seeing is a movement of also load. So oftentimes now you'll see the utilities taking and doing an analysis on where the load actually is and are the uh, transformers right sized for that particular location. If not, you'll see them now swapping them out and moving them around to just, again, create efficiencies, try to keep the lights on. Uh, Jean mentioned standardization. That is one thing we're working on. Uh, we know from the uh, engineers in the room, there are what, what Gene has categorized as red, yellows, and greens. Red, let's not touch it at all. It's, you know, the chance of finding uh, a unanimous decision on these things, not high. Yellow, the engineers are willing to have some consideration and how could we maybe standardize in a particular area. <laughs> and then green, kind of what I would consider that low-hanging fruit. Um, and that work remains ongoing. <clears throat> Gene's team is leading it. Last but not least, the utilities are uh, taking a look at their bidding requirements. This is really particular and impactful for the municipals that I represent. So again, in government, as everybody knows, it, you need three bids and you got to go with the lowest responsible bidder. What we've heard is by the time I get the third bid, if I call back my first person, they're gone, right? They've already filled that order and there's no capacity. So we've been encouraging when I've been out and about chatting, particularly with mayors, uh, state officials, anyone at that more local level, really consider um, if there, if you don't have one already, is there some sort of an emergency clause or some sort of ability to waive that billing or excuse me, that bidding requirement, particularly if there is an emergency like a hurricane, a wildfire, or things of that nature. So if you don't have something in place like that, um, it's a really, I know it sounds, but it's a really tactical, granular thing that all local municipalities and state governments should be considering at this time to ensure that the that the sector can get what they need when and if the bell rings. Um, and I believe that's my last slide. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So I will turn back to you, Joe. Thank you. Excellent. Adrian, thank you so much. I appreciate that. So Meryl's going to join us now and we've kind of laid, laid the groundwork for you, Meryl. There, there's an issue. It's a big issue. Uh, and what have you seen out there that may provide some, some off-ramp 
to mitigate some some of the constraints. Well, thank you, thank you, Joe. And it's uh, it's it's good to follow uh, this uh, esteemed group because I think they have laid the groundwork in terms of what the supply chain issues are and and some of the tools that are available uh, to resolve them as both uh, Adrian and Jean have identified. So I'm going to speak generally about the government incentives uh, that are provided under the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which which are fairly significant and lucrative. Uh, the investment tax credit provisions of the IRA have commanded the most attention, and those are investment tax credits for certain investments. Uh, the ITC can be anywhere between 30% and 70%, assuming the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements are met. Um, and many of the tax credit provisions are complex and overlapping, but what I would like to focus on for purposes of the supply chain panel is uh, in terms of the tax credits is section 48C. Uh, thank, uh, thanks, Abigail. So 48C is different than most of the other credit provisions in the IRA uh, in that it targets manufacturing and industrial processes uh, its focus is to promote investing in equipment uh, uh, that is energy related. Uh, in part, it's, it's for supply chain issues, uh, for domestic production, but there are multiple purposes behind the IRA, including jobs, uh, and also to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, energy security, and the like. Uh, but the the focus of 48C in part is to ensure domestic production, which would reduce uh, supply chain constraints that uh, we've been discussing. So in order to qualify for the 48C, what's called the Advanced Energy Facility Credit, projects or facilities generally have to relate to one of three distinct categories. Uh, it has to be for clean energy manufacturing or recycling. It has to be for an industrial or manufacturing process that results in decarbonization or lower greenhouse gases, uh, or a process for uh, refining or recycling or, or manufacturing critical materials which, that, which have been identified uh, by the DOE um, and by others, uh, both existing uh, materials and then other minerals required for the clean energy industry. Uh, the examples of qualifying investments that are provided under the IRA are, for example, projects that re-equip an industrial or manufacturing facility with equipment that is designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 20%. So these are existing plants uh, with the, the focus being to reduce their emissions there. The second example they provide is, is in manufacturing uh, or installing energy efficiency equipment or other kind of equipment that reduces waste from industrial processes. The third example is carbon capture or storage or utilization systems that take the carbon divert it to other uses as well. And then there's this catch-all, uh, other industrial technologies that are designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as determined by the secretary. Uh, and as we can see, there's there's been a focus on where there are um, supply chain issues where the uh, secretary of uh, treasury uh, and or DOE would want to focus uh, more of the financial incentives there. Uh, in this case, under 48C, what I think it's important to, to recognize is that use of that, that credit, that 30% credit in the manufacturing process uh, does not preclude uh, obtaining and qualifying for credits downstream in uh, for placing those that manufacturing property in surface. For example, if the upstream process is one that's involved with manufacturing uh, equipment that's going to be used in the solar industry or the uh, 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 energy storage industry, those products then when they're placed in service themselves can 
separately qualify for anywhere between a 30% and a 70% uh, investment tax credit, depending upon uh, whether the equipment is uh, domestically manufactured, whether it's in a, a, a environmental justice community uh, and other types of uh, targets that are provided for under the IRA. Um, in other cases, the taxpayer has to choose between uh, obtaining the 48C credit and other kinds of credits that are available. For example, there's a separate 30% credit for carbon sequestration, uh, the, the 45Q credit, uh, the 45V credit for clean hydrogen production. Uh, those uh, you would not be able to qualify for if you uh, obtain the 30% ITC under the 48C program. Uh, some of the considerations are that the 48C program is uh, competitive. Uh, there's $10 billion that's available for it. Um, and the process has uh, already started. The first phase of this closed in July. Uh, there was four or, or there's Four billion was available. The awards have not yet been made. Uh, they're not going to be made until March of this year. Um, of that four billion, 1.6 billion was targeted for uh, uh, low uh, um, uh, for for these various communities uh, defined as tracks or areas where there were coal mines or coal fire generating facilities that existed and that were closed. Before, so there's a lot of infrastructure there already, um, and the whole idea is to repurpose that for low emissions uh, or or uh, targeted types of investments consistent with uh, the clean energy provisions of, of the IRA. Um, so uh, I should also mention that in order to qualify for the 30% ITC. You do need to meet the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements that are set forth in other provisions uh, of the Act. If you don't, the credit drops to 2%. So uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it behooves you uh, to look for uh, uh, and, and to provide prevailing wages and apprenticeship uh, meeting those standards. My own experience is I, I even have projects right now that were grandfathered and did not have to meet the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements in order to obtain the 30% credit, uh, which you might think would provide an economic advantage. But as Joe mentioned, one of the constraints are labor shortages. And as a result of that, labor wages have increased to the point where uh, it, it may be, uh, and we've been rethinking using more efficient equipment now uh, because it's it's not that far reached to you to provide prevailing wages even on these older projects that began some time earlier. So um, all of those uh, I would suggest should be uh, looked at in terms of uh, uh, alternative business models for your approach to uh, meeting and, and obtaining the 48C credits. Uh, next slide. Um, another program that is available uh, is is under 45X. It's a very similar program to 48C, um, except it's uh, it targeted specific manufacturing and production of renewable components for solar, wind, inverters, batteries, uh, and also uh, critical minerals to be produced in the U.S. Uh, it's provided in a cents per watt or cents per kilogram uh, type of basis. So uh, this is, it's a type of program where you, you have to choose one or the other. And here it's simply running the model and seeing which one provides the greatest incentive to you. Uh, if this is what you're focusing, at least part of your manufacturing or your facility that, that you're targeting to obtain uh, the tax credit. So in one case, it would be the 30% tax credit under 48C. Here, uh, it would be specific to the types of inverters or modules or wind blades uh, that you uh, are seeking to manufacture in your facility. Uh, next slide. 
So in addition to the tax credits, which, as I mentioned, get the most credit, uh, most uh, focus uh, and credit, ironically, uh, there are significant other incentives that are offered by DOE and some other agencies in the form of loans, loan guarantees, um, outright grants, and outright rebates. Uh, next slide. So uh, Joe touched on the DOE loan program uh, earlier. There is a significant amount of money that's available through this, uh, through a, it was a pre-existing but refunded program under the IRA. Uh, the section called the so-called Section 1703 Loan Guarantee Program. So these are loan guarantees that cover uh, any number of technologies. Uh, a significant amount of money that's avail available, 412 million. Uh, that's targeting various uh, aspects of energy infrastructure, such as transmission projects, um, advanced technology. Uh, uh, low emission vehicle manufacturing, uh, projects that provide electricity to Indian lands, um, and uh, a, a very large chunk available for other clean energy projects. These are commercial scale projects that uh, significantly improve technology or systems, including through greenhouse gas reductions, uh, but also uh, investments similar to the ITC, but here it's in the form of a loan guarantee to expand uh, a domestic supply of critical materials. The uh, next slide, the uh, 1706 program uh, is also uh, funded with, uh, there's a $250 billion that's been appropriated in that program. And there are basically three types of programs uh, of projects that are available under that. One is for taking energy infrastructure that has already ceased operations that may be mothballed or retired and taking those plants and retooling, repurposing or replacing them. Uh, uh, in order to qualify under this program, they have to reduce greenhouse gas and other air pollutants by at least 20%. Uh, the second type of project are uh, existing energy infrastructure that similarly uh, can be retrofitted or repurposed to reduce or sequester air pollutants or greenhouse gases. And then the third type of projects are remediation projects that involve the cleanup of environmental damage that was associated with um, uh, uh, coal-fired plants or other kind of energy infrastructure. These uh, loans and loan guarantees, these are loan guarantees for the most part, they're available uh, in the form of up to a 30-year guarantee of a loan and for 80 to 100% of the loan amount. Um, and, uh, and the guarantees allow the projects to receive these loans at what would be below commercial uh, interest rates, uh, with there being a subsidy piece of this that's implicit in, in these uh, target amounts. Uh, so that's that's very important. And there have been lessons learned uh, by the DOE loan uh, program uh, office uh, to eliminate some of the red tape and some of the confusion that existed the previous time around relating to what qualifies, what what type of uh, reserves, what kind, how the um, uh, debt to equity ratios are calculated and the like. It's a very sophisticated staff of people who come from uh, backgrounds at Goldman Sachs and other investment uh, banks. So uh, you'll be very pleased in dealing with the DOE loan program. It, uh, they're, they're terrific and it, it will not slow you down. Uh, next slide. So as Gene uh, went through uh, and his and is a focus of his office, there's a variety of financial incentives involved uh, available in the form of outright grants and rebates. I just want to touch on these so we have time for some questions. Uh, but similar to the ones the programs mentioned under the 48C and under the loan guarantee programs, these are for reducing factory emissions in 
uh, for manufacturing uh, and industrial uh, plants. Uh, so those are for large uh, plants. Uh, for manufacturing uh, low uh, advanced technology vehicles, there's a lot of money. Uh, Gene mentioned the energy efficient transformer uh, program to replace older uh, inefficient transformers with, with new transformers with up to $25,000 per applicant. And I noticed in uh, the material that Gene just uh, sent me earlier is that they're willing to waive that uh, because they're looking to deploy uh, the funding available to uh, for people to install efficient transformers as quickly as possible under the program. Uh, and then there's an array of money that's available under this and other kinds of programs for interstate electric transmission lines and for planning uh, interregional and offshore wind electricity uh, uh, planning and modeling to, to bring wind power onshore. Uh, one of the things that has been noted in the Inflation Reduction Act um, and which is the subject of a much angst I know by Joe is that it really didn't focus on transmission equipment uh, in terms of the various incentives, particularly on the tax credit side. It was more focused on clean energy projects with the thinking being that the issues associated with the transmission uh, with electricity transmission, uh, it was not a question of money, but it was a question of, uh, there were other issues uh, and it was not a, a money issue that was preventing these transmission, uh, large transmission projects from uh, going forward. Of course, the other argument is, uh, you know, you throw money at anything and uh, all of a sudden people come up with solutions to problems. So there are other aspects of the funding, particularly in the DOE grant program and also in the 48C as Joe and I went through the process for transformers where there is focus again that's on the manufacturing side that provides a, a refreshing a welcome to the uh, transmission infrastructure uh, industry and trying to find solutions to some of these supply chain issues. Uh, last slide just mentioned that there is in array, there are different markets that offer their own programs, incentives that you should also be looking at. There are regional programs, there are state programs, um, and many of these allow you to value stack. In other words, you can get those benefits on top of the various federal programs that um, I've summarized uh, in, my, in my presentation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Joe uh, so we can look at uh, questions or interchange or however you want to take the, the approach the last 10 minutes. Excellent. Thank you very much for that very helpful presentation. Um, both to both Adrian and Jean, a, a quick question. We focused largely on transformers in this presentation, but it's not just a transformer issue. Uh, Adrian, in one of your slides, you mentioned uh, bare wires and meters as some other components that your members have been uh, experiencing some delays on. Uh, are, are there other components with, that your utility customers are providing? And Gene, in your conversations outside of transformers, are there other uh, issues, uh, com components that are that are uh, causing log jams? Uh, Joe, unfortunately, the answer is yes to that question. So uh, our members are seeing. I've been hearing uh, anecdotally about bucket trucks. Ooh, we're going through this all over again. Uh, bucket trucks. Um, but being on delay, significant delay, bushings, uh, anything made with resin, uh, the poles themselves, not yeah. because the wood is in short demand, but they have to get dipped in a certain solution um, to make them uh, as fire retardant as possible. And unfortunately, that is in a significant delay as well. Uh, so the short answer to your question is, is uh, no, it's not just an issue regarding distribution transformers. It's, it's beyond that. Let, 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 me, let, let me add to that because uh, starting with Adrian was exactly the right way to do it. So as as we're looking at it from the Department of Energy, we're focused like uh, crazy on distribution transformer right now because that's what industry brought to us as the most critical issue right away. But the, the, the truth of the matter is what we're doing is ensuring that we're talking with people like Adrian who are out there in the real world 
working with the utilities in the power sector who are trying to ensure things up. And, and the list of supply chain issues is much, much broader than any single component and ev even any single class of things. So it's not just distribution transformers and large power transformers. It's as Adrian pointed out there, depending on where you are and who you're talking to, everything from poles to, to elbows to this to that and the other. So what we're doing at the federal level in uh, part of the thing I have the honor of leading is ensuring that this collaboration we're building around distribution transformers today can be used to march through all of the issues that are out there and, and to create solution sets that are near-term things. Like right now we have a, a sourcing program that we offer where if you're having difficulty uh, finding the right components, the federal government will help you know, outreach on a broader basis than, than, than maybe you have to see if we can get domestic product from somewhere anywhere to you. We're doing the standardization efforts to try to reduce the amount of variability between orders to make it easier for manufacturers to keep up with uh, the demand that's out there. And, and last but not least, uh, you know, we're working on better designs and principles. So we try to reduce the amount of potential for uh, uh, supply issues to, to continue to bedevil us as we move forward. But, but this is one of those things, Joe, that I, I, again, uh, the only pushback I will have to what Adrian said earlier, she said they're working on homegrown solutions. I, I say no, they're working on common sense solutions. What can make impact in the real world today and also help to alleviate the problems into the future? And that's where we're partnering with industry. So, yeah, it's the bad news is uh, it is a, a lot more than just one component. But I think the good news is, is something that Adrian pointed out as well, that I think everyone on this call recognizes, is that everyone from the U.S. government, from the private industry, uh, recognizes that these are issues that we need to roll up our sleeves and work on together. And, you know, we, you know, quite frankly, we hope that we get congressional appropriation for Defense Production Act for transformers and things. But even in the absence of that, none of us are sitting around waiting for what, what might parachute in. We're putting together all the authorities, everything Merrill talked about. I will tell you, I've been in so many meetings with so many acronyms and so many uh, subset 48C versus you know 48X, what, 43X, whatever. Uh, long story short, we're looking to see how we can use our existing authorities, existing programs, existing resources to get as much bang for the buck out there in the real world so that we can help people like Adrian and, and her APPA constituents to get stuff done quickly, to help more manufacturing investment, to help more manufacturing, quite frankly, uh, refurbishment and, and bringing in things up to, to speed to get more production, better, better working conditions and more labor. It's, it's complex, but, but you know what? Uh, all of us on this call are working on it and we represent a whole lot of other people outside of the screen. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Merrill, one of the programs you referenced, uh, the 48C, uh, there was a, a timeline for submission of concept papers due in July, and that was for the first 4 billion tranche. Is, is the intent that there will be additional tranches released and additional opportunities if folks didn't meet that, that deadline for them to consider whether their expansion would, would qualify? Uh, yes. Uh, so the original tranche was designated for 4 billion of which 1.6 had to be in an energy community. Um, we don't know how much is going to be awarded in that tranche. Uh, it could be the full 4 billion. It could be less. I, I know at least from our experience, there was a tremendous interest um, and a lot of applications that went into that process. There is a plan for there to be, and no date has yet been announced for a second tranche and possibly even a third tranche, um, depending upon what happens in the second tranche. So uh, applicants uh, should uh, be aware of that and, and there's gonna be other opportunities to apply and to receive award of an allocation under this, as I mentioned, it's a competitive process and there are various priorities um, so you have you have to check the boxes. You have to tick those boxes if you can on your project. But if you can, the way this particular competitive process works, 
is DOE takes the first cut um, at who qualifies and sets up a priority list and then sends that over to Treasury and and who and there's a certification process of that. So um, yes, so there's at least one other tranche that will be coming down, although probably uh, not soon. They have to finish up this next this first tranche. Okay, and can a project be ongoing and an application be submitted, or does it have to be a new project post application? No, it can be. There can be a project that has been ongoing. That's the beauty of this. Um, as long as it hasn't been yet placed in service until the time of the award. So an applicant can have a project that they've already invested millions in, and that money is available to them. And in fact, by having already uh, started that project, they'll be able to check some of the boxes relating to commercial viability, because it will show that this is not pie in the sky, um, but they've already put equity capital into the project. So um those will be awarded uh, so long as the projects are not yet placed in service excellent well this has been fantastic i want to thank you all for your for your participation today great information and we've got just one minute left is there anything that we haven't talked about yet that we should or closing thoughts or uh, anything like that I have one quick cl closing thought, and I, I hope we didn't scare uh, the audience with all the talk about uh, admiring what the problem is. I hope what people are taking away is that people from the power sector, people from U.S. government uh, and organizations like yours, we are working together to, to try to find solutions. And we invite everyone out there who's listening in to, to roll up their sleeves and join us. This is this is an all hands on deck effort. And. Uh, right, quite frankly, I'm really proud of the way it works. Well, I don't think I could possibly have come up with a better closing paragraph than that, Gene. Fantastic. Uh, well said. Shame, shameless plugs. Uh, can, can keep an eye out for continued Pierce Atwood Energy Group uh, webinars like this. And if to the extent you're on and because of transformer issues and you have questions or concerns, absolutely feel free to reach out to me uh, on behalf of TMAA, and I'll be happy to do whatever I can to help answer any questions. Until next time, I appreciate all of your all of your participation and thank you very much.